Greetings everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on sculptures and temples. We have been discussing different sculptural forms as they developed during different periods of Indian history. Sculpture art is one of the oldest art forms to exist in India, rooting itself as a widespread practice even in the early Indus Valley civilization. In the context of the Indian subcontinent, sculptures remained a significant part of documenting life. Tracing the history of sculptures from early times, one can find that sculptures could act as a good basis for recreating and understanding our past. Indian sculpture artists have always been fascinated by figures from mythology and religion as it ran strongly in our culture. Sculptures of Hindu gods and goddesses, Buddha, Jaina figures and so on were some of the most common themes in sculpture art as seen from the earlier times. India also boasts sculptures of animals, birds, human figures depicting daily life activities. So, speaking from this context, one can earmark a specific royal cult that had developed as part of Kushana art. There was a strong royal cult flourishing under the Kushanas where the royal family was worshipped in a Devakula or shrine, for example, at Surk Kotal in Afghanistan and the other at Mat, just outside the town of Mathura. Here, portrait sculptures of the first four kings have been discovered, of whom Vima Ketphysis seated on a lion throne is very majestic and impressive. There is also the standing headless figure of Kanishk wearing a stiff tunic boot, holding a sword with a makara symbol on the scabbard. A head from the site donning a conical helmet also indicates what a royal figure may have looked like at that time. So, when you are giving all these examples, one can refer to the art of Mathura of the Kushana period, which had a lasting impact on the subcontinent uh, and also on subsequent art of the Guptas. Many of the sectarian forms crystallized and got elaborated henceforth. This is an example of the headless statue of Kanishk about which I had just discussed. Then another example that can be related to Mathura school of art is that of fasting Buddha. The earlobes of this Buddha are prominent and distended, reminding us of the heavy jewels they once must have worn. Then the face carries hardly any trace of human flesh. The feeble eyes are deeply sunk into sockets and the cheekbones are protruding. The cheeks are rather pinched and the skin of the forehead is pulled tightly over the skull. So, all these features kind of indicate the way Buddha would have fasted. And though the face still breathes, it seems as though every breath may be the last. And the tension and the pain uh, is also transcended by some kind of an inner peace and self-contained calm. As you can see, all these features that I have just described in this image of fasting Buddha that is presently being shown on the screen. Then another example that can be given is that of Mathura school of art in which Gautam Buddha is shown as seated and here also there is a narrative panel in the background. Uh, then if we talk about Western India, then the state of Maharashtra was also a center of artistic activity and its most famous site being the cave temples at Ajanta. Massively modeled sculpture like that of 
the cave temples of uh, Pital Khora. Then if we talk about the Andhra region, uh, while Kanishka and his successors ruled over most of northwest India, uh, the Andhra kingdom prospered in the south and Buddhist practice continued to flourish here. The rulers of this dynasty and several other dynasties were greatly influenced by contact with the Romans and the Roman traders uh, also who used to constantly visit the ports on both the western and eastern coasts probably had established a colony of the eastern coast which could have greatly influenced the cultural forms that were evolving in this region. Though stupas remained popular during this period, icons of Buddha appeared also, especially in the eastern capital of Amravati. As you can see in this example, uh, which is a beautiful example of Amravati uh, Buddhist icon in the south, which can roughly be dated from 50 to 320 CE. Now coming to the age of Guptas, when the first of the Gupta dynasty rulers started uniting many of the territories that had been part of Ashoka's empire, uh, ruling from the same capital Patliputra along the Ganges, it definitely resulted in some kind of sponsorship of arts and sciences and resulted in a new wave of literary, architectural, mathematical and medicinal developments. The sculptors of the period refined and added further to the artistic styles that they had inherited from the Kushanas and also uh, they drew on uh, the influence of Andhra culture that was prevalent in the south. What we observe uh, during the Gupta period and the sculptural forms that have been studied for Gupta period is some kind of systematization that was emerging and the artists of the period kind of uh, had a clear cut uh, view and they had evolved a way uh, that physical attributes uh, could be uh, indicated. For example, to indicate Buddha's divine status, uh, the mole between the eyes, the bump on top of his head, wheels on the palms and soles, all these were repeatedly portrayed in sculpture. It is during the Gupta period that one finds the first freestanding structures that used to house images for worship. Now, this was a major development that uh, in future was going to uh, be the basis of temple architecture. The Sanchi temples also uh, are some of the few surviving structures that have been preserved from this period uh, and though Sanchi continued to be dominated by its stupas, Gupta dynasty monks clearly also incorporated images into their worship. This image shows the structure of temples that had started developing during the Gupta period and here also we see some kind of an influence of Roman architectural features. They had gradually become part of the overall temple design and also became integral to Indian architectural styles. So the structure of the stone temples was much simpler however during this period than the structure that would evolve during the next thousand years uh, and important features like porch, entryway and inner shrine room, they all became far more complicated and bigger as time went on. Now this is an example of the structural forms that were emerging and came to be identified as temple architecture. Then another interesting development during the Gupta dynasty uh, that one can talk about is iconography, especially the one which developed from 320 to 550 CE because Gupta rulers sponsored both Buddhist as well as non-Buddhist religious traditions as had many rulers done before them. So during the period 
uh, of flourishing Buddhist iconography, one finds a smaller number of sculptures and depicting Vishnu and Shiva as well. Uh, these were the two major deities whose traditions were rapidly becoming influential from this time onwards and they also kind of claimed some kind of continuity with the ancient Vedic religion and culture. Now, following uh, sculpture which most likely adorned the top of a temple column shows Krishna counselling Arjuna as he sat despondent in his chariot. The Greek sculptural style is evident here as in the Bodhi Sattva sculptures of the Kushana period in the Gandhara region. So here again we see that it was not as if with Kushana the influence of Greco-Roman architecture came to an end. Rather, the early icons of Vishnu and Shiva definitely had some kind of influence of preceding periods as well. Also surviving from this period are several Vishnu images and the largest temple preserved from the Gupta period is also dedicated to Vishnu. Uh, unlike sculptures of uh, Buddha and other Bodhisattvas, Vishnu is often shown with multiple arms, each holding different symbols of his power including the conch shell and the lotus uh, and uh, such multi-limbed depictions could have been inspired by several Vedic references to the cosmic energy uh, and also uh, to the special features of these gods who had numerous heads, arms and legs. So all this came to be depicted in the form of iconography as well from Gupta period onwards. So the bronze Kashmiri Vishnu also sported several wheel symbols and it also was a, some kind of a reminder of Vishnu's solar radiance. Uh, then in mythological accounts, Vishnu also used his wheel as a weapon to cut down enemies which again was depicted as you can see in one of these images. So symbols became very important as far as projection of deities was concerned. Then several surviving sculptures at other locations also reveal the evidence of growing importance of Vishnu's other incarnations and depiction of Vishnu taking form as the celestial sage Narayana instructing a pupil with other deities uh, gathered around to listen to his teachings. Uh, now this again had some kind of a similarity to the way deities were depicted in some Buddhist sculptures. Then depiction of Vishnu taking the form of a boar to rescue the earth uh, from a flood. Uh, again, uh, this had uh, also uh, a lot of significance was attached to Vedic deities as well as sages who are looking on this entire process. So this again can be described as some kind of a narrative art that was being incorporated and uh, this again had some kind of influence of the preceding styles. Now besides Vishnu one can also give examples of icons of Shiva that are found during this period. The Linga with faces in four directions actually dates back to an earlier Kushana period in the region of Mathura where the first Buddhist icons were made. Then if we talk about the Gupta period figure, then it depicts Shiva in the human form of a mountaineer as well as a hunter, the way he had been described in Mahabharata. So these are kind of striking images with the multi-armed form of Shiva that began to appear during the late Gupta period, you can say from 6th CE, as you can see in these images. So Shiva iconography was equally important and it was considered as part of the overall evolution that was taking place and it was not as if 
uh, the sculptural uh, traditions or whatever changes that were coming about, uh, it was not as if there was a break from the past. So, it is very important for art historians to kind of look at the evolutionary uh, perspective and also to understand as to how sculptural art though has been one of the oldest art forms to have existed in India, but yet it was constantly evolving. It was constantly kind of adjusting and readjusting itself to changing times and uh, uh, sculptures from early times definitely have a story to narrate because a sculpture is not only an image that has been made in isolation. There is a whole lot of uh, politics, religion, economy, uh, history attached to it and it depends on the student of art history to kind of uh, unearth those uh, hidden uh, means, uh, meanings and also to kind of uh, develop a narrative uh, in which it is not only important to take records to historical facts which are part of the written record or inscriptions or historical accounts, but also s different sculptural traditions can also be used as an important reference source for reconstructing history. Thank you.